Thank you so much for being here tonight. For what it's worth to you, it's an encouragement to me uh, to be here, to see you here, to be asked to lead you in the study of God's Word. In keeping with the theme, I guess I could say it's an honor to have been invited to speak here tonight. My wife Leslie and I moved here from New Jersey back in mid-May, and in the process of trying to determine where we would uh, worship on a regular basis, uh, we attended here several times, and I'll have to tell you I found the church here very impressive, and it's indicative of your desire to grow in Christ and to encourage one another to do so, that you have a series such as this. And I trust that what I have to say tonight will be um, helpful, helpful in achieving that aim. I've been asked to consider with you tonight Paul's statement in Romans 12, verse 10, or at least the last part of verse 10, give preference to one another in honor. At least that's the wording of the New American Standard from which I preach. In his letter to the brethren at Rome, as he typically does, Paul follows the, his foregoing and larger ideological section or what some might call doctrinal section of, of a letter with uh, practical applications. And he certainly does here in his letter to uh, the Romans. In chapters 12 through 15, we have th these practical applications of what Paul has said in the foregoing part of his letter. Uh, it strikes me, and I suppose it would strike you also, that this is the natural and logical and correct order um, will hardly be inclined to do something, especially if it is challenging for us to do it, if we are not first made to understand why we should do it. So that is why I suppose Paul and the Holy Spirit through Paul then would, would first of all begin with Again, perhaps for what is, uh, lack of a better word, an ideological se section where he presents the ideas, the, the doctrines of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then follows it up with these practical sections. And this is observable from the fact that Paul begins his practical section here, with chapter 12 of Romans, with the word, therefore, in verse 1. is uh, based upon what he has just said. So in other words, why should we give preference to one another? Why should we honor one another in particular? Well, because of what he has said. Christ has redeemed us by his blood and we're in one family because of that very fact. So before Paul addresses how Christians ought to live, he addresses why they ought to live that way, roughly in chapters 1 through 11 then. And this observation emphasizes the importance of first understanding the meaning and the original application of a text before we begin making personal applications of it. Now, of course, that's the ultimate goal of our Bible study. It should be. We study the Bible because we want to learn something from it and, and learn how God would have us behave. So we are aiming for personal applications of what we study. But before we can really accurately and effectively do that, we need to understand what is being said. What does the text say? What does it mean? And what was the original application? Why did the author say it? I emphasize that because it seems to me that I have experienced times when brethren rush ahead to trying to make personal applications of the text 
without first having understood, made, making sure that they understand the meaning of the text. Now, the particular application or the particular admonition which we're focusing on here, give preference to one another in honor, Romans 12.10, uh, lies about midway among a rather lengthy series of terse imperatives. And Paul prepares for this particular exhortation and even develops it further by elaborating on the humility to which it obviously refers. And he does so with expressions going back to verse 1 of chapter 12. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. What he's going to be, to tell, what he's going to be telling us when he says give preference to one another in honor is, is going to be demanding of us. It's going, because it's going to be contrary to human nature. Humility is not something that comes to us easily, is it? So why should we be humble? Why should we give preference to one another in honor? And he prepares us for that by saying, well, you've got to bear in mind, verse 1, that we need to present our bodies a living and holy sacrifice to begin with. And then in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Uh, the people of the world are very egotistical, very selfish, we cannot, if we're going to be good Christians, we cannot afford to be conformed to the world. And as a matter of fact, he proceeds in verse 2 to say, we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then in verse 3, he says, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And in verse 5, why? Because we who are, one, uh, we who are many are one body, members of one another. And then beyond verse 12, verse 16, he says, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. By the time we understand all of these things and how we ought, the attitude that we ought to have of ourselves in relation to one another, well, we might be a little bit more prepared then to give preference to one another in honor. Now there are two words in this short, terse uh, exhortation that stand out. And if we understand them, and they're really fairly simple in their basic meaning, uh, then I think the meaning of the admonition itself will become rather clear to us. And the first of these two words, of course, is the word honor. Uh, not a word that is unfamiliar to you. It means to recognize someone, to acknowledge someone, to prize someone or something as worthy, as valuable, and precious. And then beyond that, it takes on the meaning of respect. Esteem, regard, deference, and as we go into a crescendo of meaning here, exaltation, glorification, or even reverence. Now, in English versions, it is often preceded by uh, the word preposition in, which, though it does not occur in the Greek, is suggested by the fact that honor is in the dative case. And so that's where translations get the word in from. But the Greek word for in, and yes, there is a little preposition, en, it's spelled in Greek for our English preposition in, but it doesn't occur there in the Greek. It's, it's derived grammatically from the dative case. And I say this to say that Therefore, perhaps we have a little bit of latitude in how we're going to render this prepositional phrase here. The idea 
that in means with regard to, in respect of, concerning, or simply as to, is seen from the fact that this admonition that we're looking at is one of a string of seven such phrases, all which contain a prepositional phrase, at least in the New American Standard, starting with that preposition in. So let's just refer to them. Starting off in uh, verse 10, the first part of verse 10. Well, let me get over there in the text of the Scriptures and look at it specifically. Okay, in verse 10, he starts off by saying, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. So, when it comes, he's, Paul is basically saying there, when it comes to brotherly love, or as to the matter of brotherly love, what are you to do? Well, the answer is, as he says, be devoted to one another. Let's skip for right now uh, the, the phrase that we're uh, focusing on tonight to the next one at the beginning of verse 11. He says, in diligence. Well, what he means there is with respect to diligence or as to diligence, what do you do about that? Well, you should not be lagging behind. Again, in spirit. What do you do about your spirit? Well, it is to be, uh, you're to be fervent, serving the Lord. Then in verse 12, in hope. Well, what about hope? Well, as to hope, you are to be rejoicing. What about when you're confronted with tribulation? In tribulation, well, you're to be persevering. And then in the last part of verse 12, in prayer, or as to prayer, what are you to be like? Well, you're to be devoted to prayer. And now we can go back to the end of verse 10 and note that it says, in honor. Well, what about honor? Or with regard to honor, or as to honor, the matter of honor, what are you to be like? Well, you're to give preference to one another there. So let's consider then the second of these two words that we need to consider. And that is the word preference. And I will mention the, the Greek word here from which it comes because I want to elaborate on it a little bit. Let me see if I can get the pronunciation uh, correct here. Praegeamai. It is a compound word. That is, it combine, it's a combination of two other words, uh, a root word, hegeamai, which simply means to lead. And then you've got a prepositional prefix, the Greek preposition pra, which means before, in front of, or prior to. So they're put together in this word pra hegeamai. Now, there's, there's an overlap in meaning between the preposition, which means before, and uh, the root, hegeamai. Uh, I mean, if you lead, don't you get out in front? Isn't that the idea? Well, there is a thing, I, I, I guess. <laughs> I guess the idea of leading from the rear, which uh, officers in battle might do, and I suppose properly so, but point I want to make is there, there is some redundancy uh, which occurs in the overlapping meaning of these two words, the prepositional prefix pra and the root, which means uh, to lead. Um, in, in this case, pra apparently does not change the meaning of the root. It really just intensifies or uh, emphasizes the meaning that is there in the root. And so hence, the meaning of pra egeamai means to go before, to get ahead of, to get out in front of, to surpass, outdo, outperform, or excel. And thus Paul, it seems to me, conveys his idea in what I find to be a delightfully colorful, graphic, and an emphatic way. 
He does this by using a paradox which winds up expressing itself in a hyperbole. Hyperbole is an exaggeration for effect. It's a contradiction of reality. Uh, it's like when Jesus said, um, he used a hyperbole, when you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's hyperbole because it's contrary to reality. I mean, the same brain controls both hands. So how can you let, not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing? It's, it's impossible. <clears throat> but that's the point. It's, it's a way of, of exaggerating uh, something beyond reality to, for the purpose of emphasizing it. And really, that's, as we'll see, that's kind of what we have here in this statement. A paradox is kind of a, um, a self what seems to be a self-contradiction, but, but holds an important truth, nevertheless, and that is basically true. And this writing is not unknown to Paul. Um, he, he writes or speaks in paradoxes sometimes. Here in Romans, for instance, um, when he speaks of dying that you might live, or die to sin that you might live to Christ or live to righteousness. Well, you die to live. <laughs> There's a sense in which it is true. We have to die to live. A die to one thing to live to someone or something else. Uh, it's kind of like what, what Jesus said in, in John 12, verse 24, when he says, a grain of wheat has to die in order to live and bear fruit. It's a paradox there. You have to live to die. And 12th chapter from which we're studying, he, he does have this kind of paradox here. He says, uh, beginning with verse 20, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. Is that the way you would ordinarily treat your enemy? Uh, wouldn't you want to, well, your natural visceral human urge would be to uh, hurt him in some way or to seek revenge, which Paul has said don't do in verse 19. But proceeding on in verse 20, he says, for in doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. And really saying, if you want to, in effect, he seems to be saying, if you really want to get back at your enemy in a very effective way that, that is excruciating to him, well, be very nice to him. And that's kind of parallel to what Paul is saying in the last part of of. Uh, this chapter in verse 10, uh, as, we'll, as I hope we'll see here shortly. Um, and so, Paul is saying, in effect, if you wish to surpass others, and isn't that the natural human urge? Bring attention to ourselves, get honor, surpass others, be better than anybody else at it, and, and get the glory that comes from having striven and achieved a mark out there ahead of everybody else. Well, if you want to surpass others, then what you need to be doing is giving the honor to them. That's why I say it's kind of a paradox. Or to put it another way, if you seek honor, then give honor. Now, Jesus effectively said this same thing in these passages in Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12, and parallel passages in Mark 9, also chapter 10. Um, Let's go ahead and go over to, to Matthew 23 because this is virtually the same thing that Paul is saying here in our phrase in Romans 12, verse 10. So in Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12, this is what Jesus says here. But the greatest among you shall be your servant, servant, 
And whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever exalt, humbles himself shall be exalted. So if you, if you really want to be first, then shoot for last. If you want to be the greatest, then seek to be the least. That's why I say this, this is really a, a paradox. How can you really be first by seeking to be last? the greatest by seeking to be least. Well, you see, Paul takes what we would expect in the world and turns it topsy-turvy, doesn't he? I have trouble not seeing or getting the impression of some sort of race or competition here when I think about this. Um, we picture people striving with all of their might, with all of their vigor, with all the skills they can command to get out there and get in front of everybody else. Get out in front of the pack, all out there in front, all by yourself. So Paul is taking advantage of that. He says, okay, you're in a race, you're in a competition here. Uh, if, if you want to see it that way, then strive to be the front runners in outdoing one another in the matter of honor. Excel, one in, uh, excel in virtue. One of these virtues, as he talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 and 10, excel. You're, he's telling the, tells the Thessalonians there, uh, you're doing well, you have knowledge and all of this. Uh, you, you've been excelling in that. Well, what do you do now? Excel still more. So in essence, Paul is telling them here in Romans 12b, try so hard to get ahead of others in honoring one another that you fall behind them in the effort. And so the paradox that we have here is really twofold. The first of these two paradoxes might be expressed in this way. As to honor, Paul says, get ahead of others. Get in front of them to get behind them. Or, as I said a while ago, lead from the rear in this matter. The second of these two paradoxes is if you're seeking honor, if you want honor, then give it. Give honor to get honor. Now, English versions vary in their attempts either to offer a more literal translation of Paul's idea or to try to convey the sense of it in a paraphrase of some sort. The KJV, the New King James Version, the American Standard Version, and the New American Standard Bible from which I preach use some form of the word prefer. Preferring one another, give preference to one another. Actually, even though I'm kind of biased in favor of the New American Standard, I mean, I've been using it for over 50 years. Nevertheless, uh, so, some of the others are more appealing in their in their effort at, at literalness. I think in, in trying to get literal, they, they bring out the color in the idea and they give it the emphasis that it deserves. For instance, uh, Young's literal translation, and he does get very literal, even it includes the definite article in front of uh, honor, but he says, because it's in the Greek text, but he says, in the honor, going before one another. The NIV gets at the idea by saying, honor one another above yourselves. This might be a little bit surprising, but I actually like the New World Translation put out by the Jehovah's Witnesses on this particular point. I think this is one place where uh, they didn't have a bias to get it wrong, so, so they got it right. And showing honor to one another, take the lead. They're pretty literal there. Um, Wiest says, going back to the idea of a competition, vying with one another in showing honor. 
Goodspeed says, eager to show one another honor. And I haven't liked it very much, but, but that's probably because I haven't read that much from it. It's probably a bias on my part, but I will have to say the English Standard Version here does a pretty good job and is pretty literal. Outdo one another in showing honor. Except I will note that the word showing there is an interpolation. It's, there's no word for showing in the Greek text, which gives me occasion uh, to say there's, we can raise a question about this. Outdo one another in honor. Well, what does that mean? The interpolation of showing to the text in the ESV raises a question as to whether Paul is saying that Christians must outdo or get ahead of others in getting honor or in giving honor. And I think to ask the question, if you know anything about about the scriptures and the teaching of the scriptures on this point, I'm sure that you do. Uh, you would say it's, it's in giving honor. The scriptures don't encourage us to get honor. I'll say more about that in just a moment. So we would have to say that both the immediate context, particularly what he says in verse 16. Um, do I need to I get ahead of myself here? Yeah, I did. The immediate context, particularly what he says in verse 16, about um, not being wise in our own estimation, being willing to associate with the lowly. Yeah, we, we want to, when it comes to honor, we're to be giving honor. But also the general teaching of Scripture favors the matter of giving honor to others rather than striving to get honor. But I want to say... Before we leave this point, I want to say one thing, other thing about that, and that is the idea of getting honor, striving for, not, for honor, is not altogether uh, unthinkable. Because after all, our ultimate goal as Christians is to be honorable people. The kind of people in our character uh, that, would, uh, that would lead other people to respect us, to honor us. And ultimately, of course, the Scriptures do teach that we're in this, ultimately, in a sense, to get honor, honor from God. Romans 2, verses 7 and 10 says, uh, those who are going to be saved are, are going to be given glory and honor. So that idea of getting honor is not altogether so, so far-fetched. Even though Paul is talking about getting, getting ahead of others in, in giving honor, excelling in giving honor to others, we, we need to bear in mind that, that we, we are going to get honor out of, the, out of that process. Because when we give to others, it's going to come back to us. Sooner or later, in one way or another. As a matter of fact, on that point, it's the people who are so conscious of their, of their desire and their need for honor, who are so sensitive to offenses uh, whom people are not inclined to honor. Those kind of people, if anything, we might want to steer clear of because they're, they're so sensitive about themselves and their self-image. They're so concerned about that, so conscious of that. No, we, don't, we kind of want to forget about ourselves and get caught up in the needs of others uh, that's the idea. Well, I am starting to get into the application now. 
Paul's exhortation here is to, to give preference to one another in honor or to outdo one another in giving honor is essentially and simply a call for Christians to be humble, to be outward looking, to be unselfish in the way that they treat one another. And since humility is, as I said, contrary to human nature, that's always a challenge. Paul observed in Philippians 2 verse 21 that all others seek their own interest. That's the nature of humanity, generally speaking. Uh, Self-seeking pride and resentment of those who offend our self-image, what we think of ourselves, what we think is due us, the kind of recognition that we're entitled to, have been the moral scourge of humanity since the beginning. Pride, that resentment of, a, of being affronted, have done incalculable damage. One of the three avenues of temptation we need to be reminded, according to John in 1 John 2, 16, is the pride of life. That pride, that self-consciousness, that seeking for honor and self-aggrandizement led Eve to sin. Satan said, you'll be like God if you just eat this fruit, disobey him and eat this fruit. That idea was apparently very much appealing to her. The Jewish leaders, according to John 12, verses 42 and 43, prized the approval and the praise of men rather than the approval of God. Why do we want to the praise of others? Because we have that much faith in the praise of others. We must be good people. We must be achievers because other people tell us that. So our self-image is so often dependent upon what we think others think about us that we seek their approval in order to feel good about ourselves, in order to be assured of what we think about ourselves. And we strive for that. But anyway, uh, pride, I suspect, led to Judas's betrayal of Christ. In John 12, the beginning of John 12, for instance, uh, we have Mary's, the, the account of Mary's anointing of Jesus. And John's account gives us uh, perhaps a few insights that the other accounts of this incident do not. Particularly in verse 7 of John 12, Jesus after, and, and John says it was Judas who led the way in being critical of Christ for allowing Mary to anoint him with this expensive ointment. And so, according to verse 7 though, Jesus responds to Judas with something of a rebuke. He says, let her alone. Tells Judas in front of the others, you're wrong, let her alone. Now, interesting thing about this is that this, when he tells Judas to let her alone, the pronoun is singular. What that means is, He's not talking to the group. He's specifically aiming his rebuke at Judas and telling Judas, let her alone. Now other accounts have it in the plural, but here in John 12 verse 7, let, you let, the implied you there, the you is singular, meaning Judas. It's interesting to note in a parallel account, that right after that it says Judas went out and conspired with the Jewish leaders to betray Christ. How does all of that fit into this lesson? Now Judas might have been, might have been disillusioned with Christ. I suspect he was becoming 
disillusioned with Christ before this. Maybe in his selfishness, he was looking for something that he realized Christ wasn't going to bring him. And he might have, in that respect, he might have been the most insightful of the apostles. And he had decided, you know, maybe this isn't for me. This is looking, beginning to look bad. And then on top of that, or maybe I should say to top it off, and maybe his disillusionment comes out in this complaint about what Christ is allowing here, this waste, as he would think of it. And he had already begun to steal from uh, the treasury there. On top of that then, Christ rebukes him in front of the others. This must have stung Judas, hurt his pride. And it was at that point, it seems, according to the other accounts, that he said, this is enough. I'm done with it. And he goes out and conspires to betray Christ. Of course, it was because of envy that Christ was crucified. Pilate recognized that. Envy, of course, causes dissension, division, this self-seeking, this desire to be out in front of the others for one's own interest causes division and dissension in churches. Of course, I'm thinking particularly of 3 John verses 9 and 10, where in the words of the King James Version, it was Diotrephes who loved to have the preeminence. He loved to be first. Yeah, he wanted to get out in front, but for himself, for selfish reasons. So, considering all that, it's not surprising that the Bible, in one way or another, calls for the effort to suppress pride. It tells individuals to seek the honor of others here, particularly in Romans 12, 10, rather than one's own honor. This is in keeping with passages that we find sprinkled throughout the Bible, particularly though in the New Testament, but beginning in Leviticus 19, verse 18, we're told to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that's reiterated even in the next chapter of Romans here, Romans 13, particularly verses 8 through 10. But in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 24, I like, particularly like, in connection with our point, the way that Paul puts it there. Romans 10, verse 24, Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. That's really essentially a paraphrase of what Romans 12.10b is saying. Okay, you're concerned about honor? Well, in the matter of honor, really, you need to strive to outdo others in giving them our honor to others. And of course, as I've said before, uh, Christ taught that the one who would be greatest or first should rather seek to be the least and the last. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5, it is characteristic of true love not to seek one's own interest. Christians are to emulate the example of Christ who yielded himself to the interest of others. Of course, a good commentary on Romans 12, 10b is Philippians, the second chapter, beginning with verse 3. Virtually a paraphrase of what Paul is saying in Romans 12, 10. Beginning with verse 3, Paul there says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. 
And then he goes on with the example of Christ who did that himself. Again, in Romans, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 3, this is what Paul says. Now, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached thee fell upon me. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 says, For our sakes he became poor, that we might become rich. And of course, he set the example in a very graphic way when he washed the feet of the disciples in chapter 13 of John, verses 1 through 17. It's interesting along these lines that in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, you may, re you may remember this passage as where Paul spends such a long, uh, uh, or devotes a great deal of space to... Uh, defending the right of preachers to receive support for the pre in the preaching of the gospel. And that's true. But why does Paul do that? He says, you know, I'm not saying these things for my own sake so that I can get that support. Rather, in essence, he was saying, I'm setting an example for you. I have this right to receive this support. But you know what? In the interest of others, I'm giving it up. I'm surrendering it because I'm more concerned about others than my own rights. And I will not exercise my right, though I indeed have it, if it is deleterious to uh, the spiritual welfare of others. In Philippians 1, you may remember that some were preaching the gospel, he says, out of selfish ambition and envy, thinking to cause him harm. Now, you would think that if you found out about this, some preachers were, 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 had these evil ulterior motives in preaching the gospel. Oh, you, you might be incensed by that. And, 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 and Paul, and he's the target of some of this. They're thinking to cause him harm. He should be angry. But he says, no. That's all right, even if it hurts me. I am so interested in others and their welfare and their salvation that even if I get hurt by the preaching of the gospel in some way, but they're saved, I rejoice in that. I rejoice in that. Christians are to identify themselves with others. Put themselves on the level of others if not below them. Again in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. There Paul says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In 1 Corinthians 12, he speaks of Christians as being parts of one body. And just as we get very concerned if one little part of our body is suffering in some ways or is, becomes unsightly or becomes painful, We're going to, that part of our body is going to get our great attention. Paul says we ought to be the same way. Even if a member seems to be lowly, um, not contributing much, that's the one who ought to get our attention. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 9, there Paul says, For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray for, that you be made complete. Imagine that. When we're weak and you're strong, we rejoice in that. I said, this is something that is very challenging to us 
as, as human beings. This is not the way we would, human beings would ordinarily think, but that's why Paul said at the beginning of Romans 12, you know, you've, you can't be conformed to the world. You know, you're going to have to transform your attitude massively if you're going to be the kind of Christian Christ would want you to be. Cross, Christ taught his disciples a proper sense of their own unworthiness and sinfulness. And, and Luke 17, verse 10, he says, after you've done all the things for your master, you ought to do, speaking to, to servants. You still say, you're unworthy slaves. In Luke verses 18, 13, and 14, he praises the... The, the, the tax gatherer as the one who went home justified. Why? Because he spoke of himself in prayer as the sinner. Be merciful to me, God, the sinner. And then along these lines, finally, he says in Ephesians 5 verse 21, we are to submit to one another. Now, there are all sorts of forms and degrees of submission. When we think of Ephesians 5, we think of maybe Paul's emphasis upon the fact that wives ought to be submissive to their husbands, and that is certainly true. But we, in all sorts of different ways, in all sorts of different relationships, might find ourselves in positions, at least at times, when we need to be submissive, when we need to subordinate our desires to the needs and the desires of others. It's interesting to me that before Paul goes on in verse 22 to tell wives they need to be subject to their husbands, in verse 21 he says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Yes, we're to be subject to one another. How is that? We think, well, we need to be subject to the elders, we need to be subject to the governing authorities, we need to be subject to our, uh, our em employers or bosses, uh, certainly wives need to be subject to uh, their husbands, but we're all to be in subjection to one another. How, how can that be? How is that? Well, we need to be prepared to subordinate our needs and desires, however we might perceive them, to those of others. There are going to be times when we're going to have to say, well, what I want doesn't matter that much. You know, this is what this other person needs. And it would be best for me not to have what I need in order for that person to have what he or she needs. And yes, I will say, there are times when husbands, in the sense that I've just stated, need to be submissive to their wives. What do I mean? Uh, they need to say, well, my wife needs this now, and I'm going to subordinate what I might like to do to the needs of my wife. As a matter of fact, the connection is so, is so clear between verses 21 and 22 that if, if you have a version that has uh, uh, words in italics to show that that they're interpolated and are not present in the Greek text. You'll notice in verse 22 that the word subject there in the phrase, wives be subject to your own husbands, it's actually in italics. The idea for the inclusion of the word subject in English is taken from its occurrence in verse 21 where we're told to be subject to one another. humble and unselfish and seek the honor of others above their own if they understood that first of all as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7 oh, what do you have that you did not receive all that we have all that we are has been given to us we would see occasion to be humble and unselfish when we realize our own sinfulness, and how it makes us unworthy. We're not saved because we're so good. 
It's not because of our deeds of righteousness, Paul says in Titus 3 verse 5, that we're saved. Oh, quite to the contrary. Who is there who is not needed to be saved? And they would also sense their need to be humble, unselfish, and unselfish. If they realize that they are at best, at best, only equal to their brethren. There's the poignant statement by Abraham in Genesis, the 13th chapter, where he confronts his, really, I, I, I guess he was a guardian to Lot, but technically was the nep- the uh, Lot was his nephew. So as the older, as the father figure, Abraham in his relationship with Lot, his nephew, was entitled to deference, to first choice. With one another here, why is that? Why is that? He says in the words of the King James Version, we be brethren. We're brethren. We're family. It's unseemly and improper, therefore, that we should be fighting with one another. And then what did he do? He said, I'll yield to you. The older will yield to the younger. And who should have first choice is going to yield and give first choice to the younger. To Lot. And in the context of the church, then, we may need to remember that we're brothers and sisters, we're equals, we're peers. At least one time, I have, more than one time, as I recall. congregations that had a relatively large military element because we were near military bases. And there were times when the relationship between officers and enlisted might interfere with relations within the church. And I thought, listen, when we come into relationship with one another as brethren, and we're in a context where equality ought to prevail. Listen, we're all privates. So how should Christians honor one another? Well, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about that. It's, it's almost intuitive. The answer to that question, I think, is, is almost intuitive. Perhaps the easiest and most comprehensive way to answer this question is for us to ask ourselves or seek that answer whenever we sense that we're going to be offended by the way someone has treated us, that we haven't gotten the respect to which we're entitled. And then we need to ask ourselves, what does Romans 12 verse 10 require of me? And I think then this question will answer itself. The golden rule, remember, says that we should, well, as applied to our subject tonight, should honor one another as we wish to be honored. So in answer to this question, how would we wish to be honored? Of course, though honor begins with the idea of someone's value and worthiness, honor is more than just an abstract idea. It finds expression in concrete, practical forms. As Jesus indicated when he rebuked the Jewish leaders, or the Pharisees, because they didn't obey the command of God to honor their fathers and mothers, Instead, what would have gone to the support of their fathers or mothers and the honor due them through that instead was given to God. But in connection with that, 1 Timothy 5 verses 3 and 4, 
we note that family are to honor uh, their parents and their grandparents by providing for them. Honor widows who are widows indeed, it says in verse 3. Verse 4, for if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. That's how you honor them. And notice, if you think that's taking away something from God, he uses a different word in verse 4. Let them first learn to practice piety. You really want to honor God? Honor your parents by providing for them. It's shown even in the way that brethren address one another and speak to one another. Do we speak to one another, especially in occasions when our passions might be aroused, we might be angry with one another, are we careful about how we speak to one another? It is exhibited in a willingness to let others be first or to receive more. Of course, that does not apply to potlucks. I, I, actually, yeah, it would apply to situations like potlucks or buffets. In conclusion then, and thank you for being patient with me. I'm going to realize I'm, I'm probably a little bit over time here, but I have come to my conclusion it's ironic, but it is possible for people to seek so hard to win that they lose. I'm reminded of what Paul says on that point in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 6, where he says, brethren, we're, we're taking each other to, to court, suing one another, and that before unbelievers, he says, brother takes brother to law, and that before unbelievers. And he says in verse 6, if it gets that far, listen, it's already a defeat for you. You've already lost. If you're seeking to win in court in a situation like this, you've already lost in the ways that count the most. So the church would, uh, would make much greater strides in fulfilling its mission if brethren would not think about how their brethren might have dishonored them but instead they think about how they might honor their brethren and the relationship that they have with one another. I'll close with 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Paul here again is describing the nature of true love. And so he says in verse, in verse 5 in describing that love, does not it does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. It might be that there is at least one person here this evening who have, having heard something I've said or maybe something that has been said by another previously is moved by the wisdom and the high moral standards so clearly evident in the Scriptures, where would we be today without the gospel of Jesus Christ? That person is, is moved to want to become a child of God. If you're here and you're not a child of God, but wish to become one, and wish to take on the kind of characteristics the Bible teaches us to have as children of God, you would be, like to be that kind of person. We wouldn't put upon you anything other than the script, what the Scriptures themselves call upon you to do. And that is having heard the Gospel, believe what it says to the effect that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And having come to believe that, be willing to repent of your sins. Having repented of your sins, be willing then to confess before us your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And then to be baptized or immersed in a body of water that the blood of Christ might cleanse you of your sins and bring you into the biblical process in becoming a child of God. But since then, perhaps because you've been affronted, you've not sought the honor of others, rather your own honor, and have defended it to the point that 
Maybe you have hurt yourself spiritually or others. And you now recognize that's wrong. And you want to let us know that. And by doing so, seek our encouragement as we derive encouragement from your confession. If that's your need and your desire also, we bid you to come forward and let your needs be known as together for your encouragement, we now stand and sing. <laughs>